So. Good evening, everybody. I have uh, 7.30, so I'm going to call this meeting to order. Uh, thank you for coming out. I would ask that you all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Harris, if you could call the roll members, please. Yes, Mr. President. Mr. Ballantyne. Here. Ms. Craig. Ms. Diaz. Here. Mr. Grappere. Here. Mr. smith Waydell. Here. Mr. Soto. Here. And President Reichenbach. Here. Councillor Craig is excused for this evening. We'll move right into the approval of the minutes for the May 28th, 2019 meeting. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Council comments from the public. Hearing none, Mr. Harris. Mr. Ballantyne. Aye. Ms. Diaz. Aye. Mr. Grappera. Aye. Mr. smith Waydell. Aye. Mr. Soto. Aye. President Reichenbach. Aye. Move on to proclamations, honors, awards, and resolutions of recognition. Uh, we are going to be recognizing our Adopt a Block volunteers this evening. Mayor? Yes, thank you, Council President. And I am joined by many people here in the audience tonight who have stepped up and have adopted a block in their neighborhoods. And uh, tonight I am joined um, by uh, Mr. Mike Devaney, who is our Solid Waste and Recycling Coordinator. And I'm going to let him uh, share a few remarks about um, this program and how it has grown. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming. Uh, this is a pretty exciting opportunity that we have tonight to talk about a really great program that started back in 2016. It's the Adopt-A-Block program. Uh, if you've seen the uh, blue sign with the maroon uh, outline on it and the name of a local business or a charity group or a civic organization, uh, these folks have stepped up and taken control of their block. They uh, go out there at least four times on an annual basis and pick up all the litter, and that, that really is a huge benefit because that also – keeps the litter out of our waterways and our stormwater issues. So in the city, we have 151 registered adoptable blockers now. And um, we have over 96 miles of adoptable highway. So about 22.5 miles are adopted now. So if anybody wants to step up, there's some information over there. But tonight, we're just going to recognize the folks that have stepped up since last April at this time uh, through the, uh, the beginning of June. And uh, we have a little bit of a reception for you afterwards over here in uh, the council chambers, so or the um, the commission room. So with that, we have some certificates and some folks to recognize. And when Mike calls your name, we'd love for you to come and just stand over here so we can get a group shot of everyone. I, I just can't underscore how much we appreciate having volunteers like you who are in your neighborhoods, who are setting an example uh, and helping the city in such a concrete and tangible way by re helping us reduce litter. It's something that no neighborhood wants to have any litter, and yet we all know that we need to be working together to solve this problem, and so we really appreciate your help. <coughs> so thank you. Can we give you all just a round of applause before we start? All right. Go for it, Mike. All right, first up, representing Lancaster Living Real Estate and Property Management, John Spitaleri. All right, now recognizing the, the 100 block of Hershey Avenue, Scarlet Black. And if you haven't seen this man on our Facebook page, City of Lancaster Bureau of Solid Waste and Recycling, he dresses up, he takes down the block. His name is Declan Cahill, and he cleans up the 500 block of St. Joseph Street. All right. Next up, representing the Kastner family, New Belgium Brewing Company. Okay. Uh, representing the neighbors on this block, the 600 block of Columbia Avenue, HDC Mid-Atlantic. Uh, 
Church World Services, represented by Sheila Mastropichero. Hopefully I got your name right. Representing Quality Bike Products, Corey Lally. All right, Corey. All right, representing Hillrise Mutual Housing Association, John Suarez. And representing Revelo Magazine, Todd Geiger. And the sponsor of our little reception over here, the uh, Prince Street Cafe, and also Blue Line Commissary, Commons Company, Passage, Prince Street Cafe, and Merry Maker, Crystal Weaver. And Connor. Yeah, five blocks at a time. That's how we like to get them out there. <laughs> All right, representing Atlantic Avenue, Edna and Roman Ortiz. All right, representing the Flores family, Casey Flores. All right. Representing the Way of Jesus Fellowship, Steve Kaufman. It's in the pile there, I'm sure. And last but not least, representing the rebel cause, Caden Stetler. Did we miss anybody? Anybody that wasn't on the list? No? Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you guys again for your uh, volunteer work and um, for the dedication to the neighborhoods. It absolutely makes a difference. And um, the more Adopt the Block volunteers we have, the more uh, impact we're seeing, which is very, very exciting. So you are sincerely appreciated. And thank you for taking the time to come out as well. We will move on to our first public comment period, which is reserved for citizens who contacted the city clerk prior to the meeting. We ask that you limit the duration of your comments to three minutes. Mr. Harris, do we have anybody who called ahead? Yes, Mr. President, we do. Uh, Dina Mayonis. Oh, nice job. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. If you May could just I? share your name and your street, yes. that'd be fine. Dina Mayonis, 500 block of East Chestnut Street. Thank you. May I pass this? You may, day? sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I previously had a uh, contact with Mr. Reichenbach about some issues that I have come up with um, with my property, and I would just like to share the email I sent him um, explaining the issues, and then I will um, give an update as to where I'm at with the issues. So I'm here today regarding a proposed improvement to my property on the 500 block of East Chestnut Street. I'm a proud owner of a recently renovated home, which has contributed to the rising property values on the east side. I wish to contribute to that positive trend with an improvement to my patio. A total depth of area in question is 20 feet by 22 feet wide. The original patio was an eyesore, nearly unusable due to its construction of uneven hazardous slabs of impermeable concrete. The original patio was 13 feet long, extending from the back of my house toward the alley behind it with a parking area for two cars in between. The proposed patio is 20 feet, a net addition of 7 feet. The proposed patio will be constructed of Belgard Lafitte pavers, which will be laid in such that the entire patio is permeable to rainwater per city stormwater management regulations. I was unpleasantly surprised to find that my submitted renovation 
permit was denied. I was told by the zoning department that the seven foot extension was a violation of property coverage allowance with the 65% mandated property allowance. When asked why, I was told you can pay $200 to go to the zoning board meeting, but they'll probably say no. I was left to assume his suggestion was to attend the meeting to allow me to hear the entire panel why the proposed improvement was unacceptable and was given no explanation as to why a city resident is required to expend a significant amount of money to appear before public governing authority. Why is $200 required to be placed on the agenda and appear before this committee? Why does a resident have to risk such expense for the apparent likelihood of receiving a no answer from these authorities? And why is it that the city is unwilling or unable to compromise? I have also been informed that in order to install a new patio and to be in compliance with city regulations, I am required to turn my parking area into a grass or mulch plot and park in front of the house on East Chestnut Street. This requirement is disappointing given off-street parking is both a selling point for my home and a relief to a very congested, crowded area for parking. I am trying to be an honest resident by going through the system instead of around it, like many residents do. But I have many concerns with the policies and manners in which their governance is carried out. When we, myself and my contractor, told the stormwater department our approach, including materials, for incorporating stormwater mitigation into the project, the department's response indicated that they are not familiar with the approach and or materials, and therefore would not consider this project to be compliant. My contractor's livelihood is based on landscaping and installing patios, and he is familiar with well-accepted techniques and materials for promoting drainage and managing stormwater. We are both very concerned that myself and other residents may have requests denied because of the governing authority's lack of expertise on this topic. And make no mistake, stormwater mitigation is and continues to be an issue of increasing concern and severity in cities like Lancaster City. I take the issue seriously and want to do right by my own property, those of my neighbors, and the city at large by doing my part to limit my property's impact on runoff, flooding, and so forth. But how can we as a community properly tackle this issue if those charged with enforcing regulations designed for the purpose of stormwater mitigation lack the technical expertise needed to ensure enforcement is prudent, equitable, and effective? As of right now, as you see, my backyard is in a state of despair and is unusable. I can no longer use my back door. I have strangers stopping and asking why my yard is left unworkable and, un and an unsightly mess. It's unattractive, and given the pleasing aesthetic of my home, it's an embarrassing blight to the neighborhood. I'm trying to be a caring and sensitive resident by going through the proper channels and not flouting policies. I care about my home and my neighbors, and this patio improvement not only benefits me, but continues to elevate my property value, therefore benefiting the entire neighborhood. So, since then, Mr. Reichenbach kindly got me in contact with Ruth Hawker from the Stormwater Mitigation Department, and she approved my 20 by 22 patio, and we came up together with a plan and design for the stormwater mitigation to be in compliance with the regulations. I am still being denied by the zoning department, and I would just like to know where I should be parking now that I have compromised my parking spaces for a grass area so I can have my patio. Thank you for listening, and thank you for your sure. effort. Well, thank you very much. And um, feel free to continue to communicate with me as you okay. go through the process. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Harris, do we have anybody else who called ahead this evening? We do not, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, let's move to reports requested by council. I don't believe we have any this evening. We do not know. Okay. Then we will move to reports of committees of council meetings that were held on June 3rd, 2019. Public Safety Committee, Councillor Soto. Thank you, Council President. Uh, the Public Safety Committee met uh, last Monday. Uh, two bills, two items were on the agenda. Administration Bill Number 10 authorizing a memorandum of understanding with Manheim Township for the use of fire stations, and Administration Bill Number 11, authorizing imminent domain action to take a lease interest held by Wacker Brewing at uh, 425 West King Street. And we will discuss further uh, as they come up on the agenda. Thank you. 
Let's move to Public Works Committee, Councilor Grappera. I have no report tonight, Mr. President. Thank you. Economic Development Committee, Councilor Craig. I will report for uh, Councilor Craig. <clears throat> Excuse me. There was one item on the agenda for the Economic Development Committee, and it was resolution number 28, 2019, authorizing submission of a grant, a grant application to the State Industrial Site Reuse Program for the Stadium Row Project. Uh, when that comes up on the agenda this evening, I will elaborate and go into more detail. Finance Committee, Councilor Ballantyne. Thank you, Council President. Finance did not meet during last meet last week's committee meeting, so I have no report. However, I'd like to take this time to provide Council with an update. At the May Finance Committee meeting, we were provided an introduction to the concept of the Lancaster Square Parking Garage financing by the Parking Authority to fund the new parking garage and Lancaster Public Library space. As discussed at that time, the original timeline was for the guarantee ordinance to present before Finance Committee on June 3rd with the ordinance first reading this evening and an adoption on June 25th for the LPA bond issuance in July or August. However, the LPA now anticipates receiving construction bids for the project in mid to late August and issuing their bonds in September. Based on this new timeline, the guarantee ordinance readings to council have also been pushed back. Since City Council is scheduled to meet in regular session only once each in July and August, the adjusted schedule is as follows. July 1st, discuss guarantee ordinance at Council Finance Committee. July 9, first reading of guarantee ordinance, and August 13th will be the second reading and adoption vote on the guarantee ordinance. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you for the update. Move on to Community Planning Committee. Councilor smith Waydell. Just a second. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, President Reichenbach. The Community Planning Committee did meet at the prior committee meeting. We discussed uh, Administration Bill Number 9, 2019, uh, which are going to be some text amendments to the zoning ordinance, which we'll discuss on the agenda this <coughs> evening. Uh, we discussed Administration <coughs> Resolution Number 27, 2019, uh, which we should also see authorizing submission of the CDBG and ESG uh, annual action plans. The plans. Those are uh, HUD grants. Um, we'll see a resolution authorizing the transfer of two Sunnyside properties to the Redevelopment Authority. Uh, we'll see the Historical Commission recommendation uh, for the annex property just here uh, at 151 North Queen Street. And I'm missing something. Hold on. We'll scroll back up. Hmm. And do we have, I believe we discussed, um, hmm. Long-term partner. Sounds... No. Austin Ballpark? Is that right? Um, the stadium, there was the stadium road grant authorization, but didn't we also, uh, Mr. Grappera, did, did we not also discuss the Wacker Brewing um, site, the sign shop? Am I missing that in the committee? Forgive me, guys. That's, it's public safety. That's why, because it's all right. That's that's your cup of tea. My bad. <laughs> um, so we'll be talking about all of those uh, items uh, later on in the agenda this evening. Uh, thank you, President Reichenbach, and thank you for bearing with me. Thank you, uh, Personnel Committee, Councillor Diaz. Yes, Mr. President, the Personnel Committee met June third and reviewed a nomination of Lloyd Henry and Denise Friedman for reappointment for the Fire Code Board of Appeals. Their term <clears throat> would begin July 31st, 2019 and continue to July 31st, 2022. And also, the committee also reviewed a nomination for Nicole Vasquez for the appointment of the City Revitalization Improvement and Zoning Authority. Ms. Vasquez's term will be from May 28th, 2019 to January 6th, of 2023. And I move for their appointments to be approved. <clears throat> Second. I have a motion and a second. Council comments from the public? Hearing none, Mr. Harris. Mr. Ballantyne. Aye. Ms. Craig? I'm sorry. Ms. Diaz? Here. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's okay. You, you get a do over. Aye. <laughs> Mr. Grappera? Aye. Mr. Smith Waydale? Aye. Mr. Soto? Aye. <clears throat> President Reichenbach? Aye. Anything else, Council? That'll be all, Mr. President. Terrific. Thank you. 
We will move on to our legislative agenda, the Heritage Conservation and Historic District. Um, I'll make a request that we take these separately, Mr. Harris, if you wouldn't mind. So let's start with A, Lancaster Parking Authority. Yes, Mr. President. The uh, Lancaster Parking Authority, owner of 151 North Queen Street, proposes demolition of modern concrete, concrete structures to allow new construction on uh, the site at 151 North Queen Street. And this application was recommended for approval by the Historical Commission. <clears throat> Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Council comments from the public. It's one of the rare times where a demolition is not going to get comments. I think everybody knows what the annex looks like, so that's terrific. Okay. Hearing none, Mr. Harris. Mr. Ballantyne. Aye. Ms. Diaz. Aye. Mr. Gruper. Aye. Mr. smith Aye. Mr. Soto. Aye. And President Reichenbach. Aye. Move on to uh, Daniel and Lori Kerr. Daniel and Lori Kerr, owners of 113 North, I'm sorry, South Duke Street, uh, request installation of a new wooden door panel within an existing opening on the building's facade. And that was recommended for approval by the Historical, Historical Architectural Review Board. Motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Council comments <coughs> from the public? Hearing none, Mr. Harris. Mr. Ballantyne. Aye. Ms. Diaz. Aye. Mr. Gerpera. Aye. Mr. smith Aye. Mr. Soto. Aye. And President Reichenbach. Aye. We'll move on to uh, ordinance for first reading. Uh, these will not be voted on this evening. Uh, public hearing, administration bill number 9, 2019, amending the zoning ordinance. An ordinance of the city of the Lancaster City Council amending the city of Lancaster zoning ordinance, ordinance number six, 2013, chapter 300 of the city code, as amended by ordinance number 10, 2017, as follows to modify provisions related to a second residential building on a lot, to add a riparian buffer provisions to the floodplain regulations, to modify the parking requirement for visitor house rental, to add bicycle parking requirements for new and expanded uses, to modify requirements for access to residential parking facilities by eliminating the use of stone or gravel for public, common, or private right-of-way, to modify provisions for reduction in parking requirements for certain residential dwellings, to reduce thresholds for the conversion of buildings to two-family or multifamily dwellings, to add fire, fireworks sales and micro distilleries to the table of permitted uses, to modify conditions for approval for vending carts and trucks for commercial service uses in the R3 and R4 districts, to modify the minimum lot area requirement for multifamily dwellings in six zoning districts, to waive certain dimensional requirements for conversion of existing buildings into residential units, to add a definition for small wireless communications facility, section 387, subpart A, one, to add a new subpart G, providing for the, act, for the action for applications for non-tower WCFs within 60 days, section 387, subpart A, to delete subpart B, section 387, subpart B, subpart one, subpart, Five, to identify the timing for completion of actions for on applications for telecommunications towers and small wireless communications facilities, to make editing improvements and provide for the repeal of inconsistent ordinances, providing for the severability of the ordinance, and providing that the ordinance shall take effect in accordance with Pennsylvania law. The title, Mr. President. You don't think government's exciting, then you've never heard in the zoning ordinance amendment read into the public, so... There you go for that. Uh, Councilman smith Waydell, Councilor smith Waydell. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Randy and or Douglas to give us a brief overview of what we're going to be seeing in these amendments. So first, um, in accordance with the provisions of the Pennsylvania Municipal Planning Code, City Council must conduct a public hearing uh, on a zoning text amendment. Uh, we have had several meetings with City Council at the committee meeting level, uh, as well as with the Planning Commission, uh, but this is a, an official public hearing 
related to the zoning text amendments prior to the adoption of an ordinance. Uh, I'm not going to repeat what uh, Mr. <laughs> Harris just went through uh, in the way he went through it, but I do want to provide a little bit of context to the amendments that are being made, and I will try to do that briefly. Um, so we are presenting a formal recommendation for zoning text amendments to council tonight, uh, generally related to bicycle parking, riparian buffers, wireless communications facilities are the primary uh, amendments that are being made, and then others related to short-term rental parking, conversion of buildings, adding second residential building on a lot, and as you heard, fireworks, sales, and micro distilleries. Uh, the proposed zoning ordinance amendments that we are uh, introducing are consistent with the city's comprehensive plan, with its strategic plan, and with building on strength. Uh, the Lancaster County Planning Commission has determined that the amendments are consistent with Places 2040, uh, as well as growing together. Uh, and the Land Use Advisory Board of the Lancaster Intermunicipal Committee reviewed these amendments and has also considered them to be consistent with growing together. On May 1st, the Lancaster City Planning Commission formally voted to adopt these, or to recommend the to City Council for approval the amendments that we're going to proceed. And the last piece of uh, information is that the small wireless communication facilities information is being presented primarily to update our current ordinance so it complies with recently adopted uh, Federal Communications Commission uh, regulations. So I'm gonna go through minor changes and edits. Uh, not everybody would potentially assume that these are minor, but I believe they are. Um, and I'm gonna to refer to sections within the zoning ordinance. Uh, for everyone's benefit, this actually uh, will be uh, presented both in an um, uh, a advertisement as well as on our website, so you can reference uh, the language of the particular amendments that I'm going to summarize. Um, on co campus overlay, it's a very minor amendment of uh, referencing the city sign ordinance instead of the sign uh, chapter within the zoning ordinance, which was replaced by a new city sign ordinance. Uh, we are adding a def definition of riparian buffer to the floodplain district section, as well as a definition for 500-year floodplain, and I'll explain a little bit later why that makes sense. Uh, we are changing language in Article 8 regarding off-street parking requirements for visitor house rentals by changing the language to re require at least one parking space per dwelling and those with four or more bedrooms and an additional parking space. I do want to emphasize we're not currently recommending any other short-term rental amendments to the zoning ordinance, but we are recommending that this be a topic of the community conversation when we uh, move forward with updating the city's comprehensive plan. And my expectation is at that point in time, the city would have additional short-term rental amendments to the zoning ordinance, uh, and particularly using the guidance of the county planning commission that was just recently issued. In section 300, the location of parking facilities, we've expanded the language regarding requirements for surface materials uh, and removed a reference that was simply paved or stoned. Uh, the language now prohibits the use of stone or gravel on newly created spaces to minimize impact on stormwater runoff. Under reduction of residential park, district parking, we added the reference for lots where a second residential unit is going to be proposed, and I'll talk about that in a minute when we get to accessory units. In Article 17 definitions, we added language to the de definition of an apartment dwelling, uh, just noting existing language that already exists uh, is in place in the table of uses. Uh, we added the definition of a bicycle parking facility, and again, I'll emphasize that a little bit later. We amended the definition of a grocery store by removing specific hours of reference, be, uh, hours of operation reference between 5 a.m. and 11 p.m., but it was simply moved to the table of uses as a footnote. Uh, in the table permitted uses, we lowered the required minimum square footage to convert an existing building into a two-family dwelling, uh, including efficiencies from 3,500 square feet to 2,000 square feet, and for conversion of a building to multifamily, including efficiencies from 3,500 to 2,500. While I have that listed in some of the minor changes, it's actually a rather significant change. Uh, to enable conversion of additional properties, especially with our tight rental market that we have in the city. We changed the reference uh, again to Chapter 255 of the, zone, of the Signing Ordinance, 
uh, in a residential footnote about general home occupations. We amended the commercial retail section by adding fireworks. Uh, we've limited their sales to some commercial and suburban manufacturing areas, primarily those around Costco and Lowe's, along the Fruitville Pike and Mannheim Pike commercial corridors and Park City. So within the four and a half square miles of the core of the city, firework sales would not be permitted. Um, we've amended commercial services footnotes to stipulate that um, in certain R3 and R4 residential districts, certain uses that are permitted by right would have to have hours of operation limited to 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. If they choose to operate outside of those hours, they can request a special exception uh, to the zoning hearing board. Um, and those are primarily in mixed-use central business districts, central manufacturing, suburban commercial, and commercial regional districts. On the table of height area and bulk regulations, we increased the minimum lot size for multifamily dwellings in R3 to 3,600 square foot from 1,500 square foot. And in R4, uh, RO, which is residential occupants or residential office, uh, C1 and C2, which are commercial, urban, and commercial neighborhood, and mixed use to 3,600 for one and three stories and 6,300 for three or over three stories. Again, just to accommodate the increased density within a, a particular lot. In footnote D, we've deleted language that prohibited the conversion of a one-family dwelling into a two or more dwelling units. Um, that language uh, is specific to R3 and R4, which are medium and high density residential neighborhoods. RO, which is residential and office. C1, which is a neighborhood commercial, and C2, which is urban commercial, and mixed-use districts. So it still wouldn't be allowed in R2 and R1 districts. Uh, there is an added requirement that parking requirements would still need to be maintained by the ordinance, and non-conforming -lot, non lot coverages could not be increased. So those are the what I classify as the minor amendments to language and definitions and editing. Uh, we've made three significant uh, additional sections to the zoning ordinance through this text amendment. Uh, the first is related to protecting and preserving riparian buffers along existing water courses. Uh, <clears throat> in one section, it specifically prohibits the removal of trees larger than two inches in diameter without city approval. Uh, it restricts the use of fertilizers and pesticides unless approved by the city. Uh, the removal of a riparian buffer in the 100-year floodplain that is not consistent with current DEP and UDA, uh, UDAS guidelines uh, could not be completed without uh, approval and review by the city. And removal of more than 20% of a buffer in a 500-year floodplain uh, that is not consistent with those standards would also not be permitted. Uh, the second major amendment that we made uh, was to section 341 regarding bicycle parking. Uh, the existing language in the ordinance related to bicycle parking simply refers to the requirement of providing five or more bike spaces if a facility was in excess of 10,000 square foot. Uh, if you go to read the language that we're adding, we significantly expanded uh, the requirements for bicycle parking uh, related to non-residential uses that are larger than 2,000 square feet to multifamily, to multifamily with 10 or more dwelling units, uh, as well as where we have an accessory unit on a principal property. Uh, in all of those cases, we require a certain level of parking spaces, usually for one uh, larger than 2,000, it's one for every 10,000 square feet or gross floor area. It's also tied to employees of one per 20 employees. For multifamily, it's one for every five dwelling units. For multifamily of 10 or more, it's one per every 10 dwelling units. Um, so we've, we've also addressed the location of bicycle parking facilities, requiring that they be located on the property in or adjacent to the public right of way. Um, bicycle parking facilities on the lot have to be located on paved surface accessible from the public right of way via a paved right-of-way. They must be placed in the public right-of-way to achieve the required number of spaces that I just reviewed, provided the city engineer approves the installation prior to the issuance of a required zoning approval. To the maximum extent possible, bicycle parking facilities should be outside a building and located within a 50-foot radius of the primary building entrance. 
and bicycle parking facilities of more than 10 spaces should be covered to protect bicycles from the rain, snow, or other elements. Um, it, it actually says shall be covered, not should be covered. Uh, and finally, a fee can be paid per required space in lieu of providing that space if the city engineer determines that a space, uh, that it cannot provide the sufficient number of spaces on the lot or the public right of way. Uh, we've also provided language that will reduce the number of required spaces, parking spaces for vehicles, by one for every five theft proof lockers, indoor spaces, covered outdoor spaces, or a combination thereof. Uh, up to a 10% reduction of those parking requirements. And they must comply with other requirements of the section. And then, as I stated, the final major amendment uh, was adding new definitions for small wireless communication facilities and adding language that allows us to meet the timing of approval requirements required by the FCC. Um, my last comment uh, tonight is the first reading of this ordinance. Uh, on tomorrow, a legal notice will appear in the uh, Lancaster newspapers, uh, both the full text of that amendment and it will be in the law library. It will also be posted on our website. City Council would be expected to take action on a second reading uh, June 25th. Uh, it would then uh, be presented to the County Planning Commission on the 28th uh, and take effect as a, uh, appropriate by law with it. I believe is 20 days from its adoption. So if there are any technical questions, that's why I have Douglas here. Uh, <laughs> if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I think it's, it's essentially as discussed at the last committee meeting um, with the knowledge, as Randy mentioned, that this is not the end-all, be-all of our zoning ordinance, and there will be more amendments, and sometime uh, in the future soon we'll begin the comprehensive plan uh, process, and sadly we'll be doing it without you, Randy. Yeah. Um, but so I don't have any questions unless the rest of council does. Any questions? <clears throat> questions from the public? We'll have a second reading of this in its beautiful entirety. And um, Randy, if you wouldn't mind just repeating the whole thing at the end of the I month, that will. would be great verbatim, if that's okay. We can I bring can a keyboard, that. actually. We can, yes. We can actually read the actual <laughs> amendments. <laughs> yes. There we go. Uh, well, thank you, Randy. I appreciate it. Officially, this closes the public hearing. Okay. We are officially closed. Thank you. It's not met all the requirements for the public hearing. We will move on to Administration Bill Number 10, 2019, authorizing a memorandum of understanding with Mannheim Township for use of a fire station. Mr. Harris. Yes, Mr. President. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Lancaster, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, authorizing the city to enter into an intergovernmental cooperative agreement with the Township of Mannheim regarding the use of the fire station located at 1396 Orchard Street, Lancaster County, setting forth the duration of the term of the agreement, the purposes and objectives of the agreement, the manner and extent of financing the agreement, the organizational structure for the implementation of the agreement, the manner in which property is acquired, managed, or licensed, or disposed of under and pursuant to the agreement, repealing, providing for the repeal of inconsistent ordinances, providing for the severability of the ordinance, and prov providing that the ordinance shall take effect. Councilor Soto. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. The memorandum understanding concerns the Bureau's use of Manhattan Township Station at Orchard Street during the reconstruction of the city's West King East West King Street Fire Station. A city engine company will be stationed in Manhattan Township facility off Fruitfield Pike. For an anticipated eight months, Manhattan Township will renovate the facility, provide separate bathrooms, showers, and dormitory facilities for the use of city firefighters during that time. A separate alarm system will be provided along the city's fire, for fire call, calls. The city will pay the township $500 per month for the use of the station during this time of the firefighters are stationed there. The only areas outside the 2.5 mile range of the, of the are those in the city's southern annexed areas. There were 48 calls to those areas in the first five months of the year, or about 4% of total fire calls. The location will improve fire response time to the northern half of the city during the reconstruction of the east and west King Street fire stations. 
Uh, Chief Little, do you have anything else to add? Hi, Thanks, Chief. Council. So for everybody, as uh, Council Member uh, Soto uh, stated, it's $500 a month for the operating expenses, so uh, technically no rent payment uh, working on this agreement. I did attend Mannheim Township's uh, commissioner meeting last evening, and they had full support of passing of the ordinance uh, on their side of it. And as Commissioner Kling, who's our current president, stated, this arrangement benefits everybody and is an example of the kinds of benefits that can come from a good relationship with our neighbors. Um, so this is uh, definitely a game changer throughout the region of what we're doing and working with Mannheim Township. Thank you, Chief. Yes. Thank you, Chief. Chief, um, quick question. Was this a uh, Manham Township renovation uh, planned, or, or are they doing this just for us? Yeah, they, uh, they're they actually doing it for us, the majority of the, the new upgrades in, in the bathroom and the dorms, um, with the, the on, on look of their future um, staffing and knowing that they have to do it anyways in the next couple of years due to increased um, career staffing out there. So uh, they see it as a perfect opportunity to knock those uh, building uh, uh, remodel um, out. So it's a perfect time uh, for what we're doing and, and their their relationship with us and, and what we're doing as a fire service together uh, from training, running calls together. Uh, it just uh, naturally makes sense that we go down this uh, path and, and see where that future will, will lead both um, municipalities. Good timing for all. Yeah. Correct, sir. And Chief, I want to thank you for your leadership in this process. Yep, thank you. <clears throat> yeah. well, myself as well, Chief. Um, for years, we've been talking about cooperation with Manhunt Township and some sur surrounding municipalities. And uh, this, I've been talking about this all week in just random conversations because I think it's such a big deal that um, the fact that you went to a Manheim Township Commissioner's meeting last night got full support for legit cooperation between two municipalities. That just makes sense. Um, it seems like a no-brainer, but that is a long time coming. So thank you. And I really do think it will have an impact for uh, – I hope they're calling you right now saying it wasn't unanimous. Maybe they're reminding you of it. Um, but I do think it will have an impact on other relationships that we really need to boost, not just in the fire, but other um, development uh, across the board. It's just a good thing, and it's a good start. So thank you for helping us get a toehold with that. Yep, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Um, so that uh, bill will, again, be voted on at our June 25th meeting, as the previous one will be as well. Move on to Administration Bill Number 11, 2019. An ordinance of the Council of the City of Lancaster authorizing and directing the proper officers of the City of Lancaster to exercise the City's powers of eminent domain set forth in Section 2801 of the Third Class City Code, 11 PACS Section, and Section 303 of the uh, Optional Third Class City Charter Law, 53 PS Section 41303, to appropriate and take any and all interests of Wacker Brewing Company, including tenancy interests in the property known as 425 West King Street, Lancaster City, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, providing for the repeal of inconsistent ordinances, providing for the severability of the ordinance, and providing that the ordinance shall take effect in accordance with Pennsylvania law. And I will again hand this over to Councillor Soda. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, Randy, could you please come up and give, you a, give us a brief <laughs> I was going to say this could actually take longer than the zoning text amendments. Um, so briefly, uh, the city entered into a lease with Wacker Brewing uh, in January of 2018. At that time, uh, the city was did not believe that it was going to use the sign shop building, which the city owned. So this building that we're talking about is actually located on city property and is owned by the city. We entered into a lease agreement with Wacker Brewing at the time with an expectation of subdividing the building off, uh, transferring it to the Redevelopment Authority, and uh, putting the property up for sale. Uh, Wacker Brewing uh, asked if they could move in uh, to use the facility for storage and warehousing in the meantime, uh, and that was the lease arrangement. So the lease that's provided is to allow them to use that facility for uh, warehousing and storage only. 
Uh, since that time, uh, as we've continued to look at the design of the fire stations and operational uh, issues, uh, it's been decided that the city does, in fact, need uh, the that site uh, where the sign shop is located. Uh, whether the city retains the sign shop or not is not the issue, but it needs that acreage uh, for the redevelopment of the fire station at 425 West King Street. Uh, because the lease agreement that was signed with the intent of selling the building did not have a termination provision in it for the city, uh, it uh, allows Wacker Brewing to continue to lease that space. Uh, so in an unusual situation here, we're using the eminent domain proceedings to terminate that lease interest in the property. Uh, we're not taking the property because the city already owns the property but we're uh, using eminent domain to terminate that lease. We'll uh, enter into a negotiation with Wacker Brewing for fair compensation for terminating that lease and moving forward. In order to use eminent domain, city council must pass a, an ordinance authorizing the city to use eminent domain in any way, shape, or form, whether it's for a property or, in this case, uh, uh, a lease interest in a property. Thank you, Randy. <clears throat> Thank you, Randy. Uh, and we will again be revisiting this issue on the uh, 25th of June, unless something resolves itself between now and then, in which case that wouldn't be necessary. So the next three resolutions are for action this evening. First up is resolution, administration resolution number 26, 2019. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Lancaster, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, authorizing the transfer of 152 Juniata Avenue and 1361 South Duke Street to the Redevelopment Authority of the City of Lancaster. I hear a motion. Motion to approve. Second. second. Motion and a second. Councillor smith Waydell. So uh, this authorizes the, the, the two properties, as uh, Mr. Harris said, be transferred to the Redevelopment Authority. These are two properties kind of at an odd corner at the bottom of the Sunnyside Peninsula uh, that the city currently owns and has no interest in keeping. And so in transferring it to the Redevelopment Authority, it puts us a step closer uh, to ensuring that the those parcels of land can be put to the the uh, highest and best use, as they might be reparceled, rezoned, what have you. Uh, the redevelopment authority is, uh, at least from the city's perspective, the best place for those right now. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Other council comments from the public? Randy. Oh, Randy, has some. Randy, you want to be the public this evening? Please. <laughs> I just want to add one piece. Normally, we wouldn't do this just to do it. There's a building that sits on 156 Juniata Avenue, which is owned by the Redevelopment Authority. Mm -hmm. But a portion of that building sits on 152 Juniata Avenue. It actually straddles the property line. And that's the reason we're doing this, so that when the Redevelopment Authority goes to sell the property they own, they can do so with the clearance mm -hmm. and the ability to deal with that building that now sits on the property line. Okay. What, what type of building? It's a condemned residential structure that actually needs to be demolished. Okay. And this is, if I'm correct if I'm wrong, right, this is in the Sunnyside area where there are some unique lines drawn over the years or some buildings that were built. Yes. The one so the, the, this is um, a, a property formerly owned by Mr. McMichael. Yeah. Um, Great. Thank you, Randy. Any other comments from the public? Hearing none, Mr. Harris. Mr. Ballantyne. <clears throat> Aye. Ms. Diaz? Aye. Mr. Gripera? Aye. Mr. Smith Waydell? Aye. Mr. Soto? Aye. And President Reichenbach? Aye. Administration Resolution Number 27, 2019. A resolution of the Council of the City of Lancaster authorizing the mayor to submit the 2019 annual action plan year four of the city's five-year consolidated plan to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. The submission includes the projected use of funds for the Community Development Block Grant and Emergency Solutions Grant programs during the 2019 program year. Motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Councillor smith out. So uh, as Mr. Harris said, these are the CDBG and ESG action plan uh, submissions we 
have to do this uh, in part to continue to get funding from HUD to do the very important things that we do with said funding. Uh, Ms. Bartlett, would you be so kind as to come up and illuminate us as to uh, just, a, just a brief overview as to what we'll be submitting this year? Hi. Hey. Um, so yes, we'll be submitting an action plan that follows our um, current five-year consolidated plan. Um, so at the last committee meeting, you asked me to kind of elaborate on what CDBG and ESG um, was, and I feel like I have a better answer. So community development block grant, those funds are used to supplement a lot of our uh, internal departments. So they go towards street improvement, they go towards crime prevention, they go towards our housing and code enforcement programs, and they kind of boost those budgets. Uh, we also have a few external partners, uh, LHOP and Assets, that help us um, develop uh, economic development, um, but also help protect tenants. We also uh, have the Emergency Solutions Grant, which helps our homeless population. Uh, we are putting the majority of that $130,000 that we get in that budget into rapid rehousing to get people quickly from um, homelessness into housing following a housing first model, which um, suggests that a person who is homeless must have a home first that, to then start recovering in other areas. Um, so that is kind of an overall of what those two budgets, budget lines kind of uh, encompass. I also wanted to mention to you guys and to everyone, I briefly mentioned at the committee meeting, that these dollars, the amount that we get, which is 130 approximately in ESG and about 1.7 million in uh, CDBG, those numbers are dictated by the census, which is coming up. I hope that we can, as a community, um, prepare for it and get a complete count because it's really important to get that full budget line. I went over the budget at the committee meeting. I don't know if there's any specific questions about that. And if there's still a chance to review those numbers and talk about them, we submit this Friday, ideally. Thank you. Thank you. I had a question. Susanna. Susanna. Susanna, can you come back up? Oh, sorry. In reference to um, the homeless population, is that something that you have like a certain amount for each person or is it just an organization? How exactly is that distributed? That's a great question. I know that we've been thinking about um, how to set a specific cost per person. It's a challenging thing to do because we have multiple organizations that help develop and a rapid rehousing infrastructure, and we also have a, um, a bunch of different case workers who all have slightly different um, success rates. Um, so it's hard to determine specific costs per person, um, but we are actually, I know that the Coalition to End Homelessness um, is trying to determine that unit cost. I'd be happy to just connect you and also show you what research we've done so far. And in reference to um, priorities, is there, like, do you prioritize families that have children first, or is it, do you know what the breakdown is? Uh, I, I know that we can't legally pr um, prioritize any specific person based on, uh, due to, um, I'm forgetting the specific federal law. It's, like, fair housing. Yeah, and there's this thing called the um, LA SPDAT. Is that what's it called? The, it's it's the, an acronym that uh, prioritizes people based on uh, the severity of their situation. So it takes into a fa account a lot of factors. But I know that um, your gender, your race, is kept out of it due to fair housing regulations and laws. I was referring to mo mostly, if, like for example, children. You know, parents families, single parents that have children, if those are um, first first come, you know? It's a complicated question. Uh, no, because that also is a fair housing um, regulation, but we also have specific programs that, um, that work to help those specific types of families. Um, so in some ways, yes, if there's availability at a particular program site, um, it will be easier to house those particular families. Um, but for the most part, due to fair housing laws, we, we can't do that. 
right. and to <laughs> Councilman you, Diaz, to add on to what uh, Ms. Bartlett is saying um, just in that moment, uh, the availability of certain programs, or if you want to say beds or shelter space or housing uh, at the various organizations that comprise the Homelessness Coalition may lead uh, certain, say, families with children, single mothers, uh, survivors of domestic violence to be moved uh, through the rapid rehousing process more quickly, uh, but she's correct that they're not allowed to set a specific within program priority. It has to do with uh, access. And so one of the things that we struggle with countywide uh, is housing, for example, uh, fathers uh, with children or uh, men with the whole family unit. And that's just a question of the shelter space and housing opportunities currently available. Those funds aren't you typically used to create new housing there uh, in terms of like new structures. They're used to connect people uh, to services and housing opportunities that are available in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And I'll get more information to you, Ms. Thanks. Any other questions from council? From the public? Oh, actually, Mr. President, I will, I will sure. here mention um, that the Homelessness Coalition is looking to expand its definition of homelessness uh, to embrace the Department of Education's definition of, of homelessness, uh, which includes students who are and their families who may be doubled up due to housing costs or living in other irregular situations, which in case you've ever heard, uh, for example, the Homelessness Coalition and the School District of Lancaster give vastly different numbers as to the number of homeless people or families in the county. Uh, that is why the two federal departments use different definitions to determine who is homeless and therefore eligible for services. Just wanted to take a moment to clarify that. Thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions, Mr. Harris. Mr. Ballantyne. Aye. Ms. Diaz? Aye. Mr. Grappera? Aye. Mr. Smith Waydale? Aye. Mr. Soto? Aye. And President Reichenbach? Aye. Administration Resolution Number 28, 2019. A resolution of the Council of the City of Lancaster, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, authorizing the submission of an application to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's Industrial Site Reuse Program requesting a grant from the Commonwealth Financing Authority in the amount of $33,726.75 to support the Second Strong and Detweiler LLC Stadium Row Project and authorizing and designating officials to execute any associated grant documents. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. I will do my best to uh, impersonate Councillor Craig. Uh, during the uh, committee meeting, we discussed this resolution and um, the basics of it, uh, some of which are in the title, is that the uh, Industrial Sites Reuse Program uh, provides state grant monies to municipalities for environmental assessment and re remediation for former industrial sites. Uh, the site that we're discussing now um, <clears throat> was previously a uh, industrial site that will now be uh, if the process goes forward, uh, will be used, used to be Warful Construction Company actually, um, will be used uh, as a housing site. So uh, one of the many things to go through when you're uh, uh, creating new housing is environmental remediation assessment and possible remediation if necessary. Uh, because of the site having a, um, a historic nature of having construction and other industrial sites on it, uh, it became necessary. So the uh, grant funds at this point will be used for the second phase. The first phase of environmental assessment has already been done by the uh, owners of the property, and these grant funds will be used for that second phase. Um, there is a conversation about the possibility of coming back for resolutions for future grant funding to uh, complete any uh, remediation that might be done on that site. Comments from council? From the public? Hearing none, Mr. Harris. Mr. Ballantyne. Aye. Ms. Diaz. Aye. Mr. Grappera. Aye. Mr. smith Waydale. Aye. Mr. Soto. Aye. And President Reichenbach. Aye. Move into our second public comment period, and this is open for comments about issues that were not on tonight's agenda. I would again ask that you limit the duration of your comments to three minutes. Is there anybody who has comments about issues that were not on the agenda this evening? Hearing none, we'll move to the report of the mayor. 
Thank you, President Reichenbach. Uh, tonight, I'm pleased to announce that Chris Delfs, D-E-L-F-S, will be joining us as the city's Director of Community Planning and Economic Development. Chris currently serves as Deputy Director for the DC Office of Planning, where he manages the community planning and design functions for the agency. His team has focused on citywide land use planning, as well as more targeted small area plans for neighborhoods. As part of these efforts, he and his team have communicated with stakeholders in a range of innovative ways, including creative placemaking that's used temporary design, art, and social gathering to activate public spaces and generate di dialogue inclusive of a diverse community. From 2015 to 2018, Chris served as Chief of Staff for the DC Office of Planning where he oversaw the work, of, work program and operations of 72 employees and an agency budget of 10 million. In this role, he was also responsible for organizational development, legislative affairs, and special pro projects focused on key re redevelopment sites across Washington, DC. Chris holds a BA from Middlebury College in Vermont, an MAS from American University and the United Nations University for Peace in Costa Rica as well as a certificate in collaborative government governance from the Harvard University Kennedy School. Chris is passionate about great civic spaces and design and spends his time outside of work hiking, biking, and exploring local arts and music, uh, typically with his wife and three young kids, um, which makes him kind of a perfect fit for Lancaster. It has been a long, multi-step journey, and every step, Chris has impressed the staff and the executive leadership team. His management philosophy of setting clear priorities, doing the work, empowering staff, and injecting a little fun aligns with the city's culture. His substantial knowledge of urban planning disciplines, ranging from land use and transportation to parks and public facilities, along with his values around sustainable development, inclusive neighborhood-driven planning, and a commitment to public service, were self-evident uh, during the interview process. We look forward to welcoming Chris to our team on Monday, July the 8th. And uh, just a footnote to that, um, he, uh, we will also be uh, saying goodbye to Randy in a few days, which I'm still wrapping my head around. And uh, at the same time, um, there will be uh, a consultant agreement set up so that um, Mr. Patterson can help to support Chris in his transition um, when uh, later in the summer. So it'll be a good start for Chris um, to really focus on July and internally getting to know uh, staff and how the city uh, government works here in Lancaster and then switching gears to some of our external partners in uh, August. And I will be looking to city council members to help uh, introduce Chris to our residents, our neighborhoods, um, partners, et cetera. Okay, moving on. Hiring. The city of Lancaster will also be retaining a national search firm to assist in the recruitment of three positions. Director of Public Works upon the resignation of Ms. Katzenmoyer late, late last year, a water utility manager upon the retirement of John Holden in April, and technical project manager, a position that's been vacant for several years. Uh, this person oversees capital projects to enhance the water distribution system. Unfortunately, in the, in the area of public works, we have been suffering from an extremely tight labor market and need some additional help with our recruiting efforts. Additionally, there have been and will continue to be many other retirements. As you know, 30% of our workforce is at or approaching retirement age, and we recognize that hiring a workforce that reflects the diversity of our city is a huge opportunity and will take time. From the outset of the process to hire a new director of community planning and economic development, for example, we made a commitment to ensure that at least one of the finalists was a candidate of color. This meant we had to extend the timeline by several months, and ultimately, we were successful in recruiting a candidate of color. However, that candidate subsequently withdrew. Our commitment in all of our hiring is to take the time and effort needed to diversify the city staff team so that it looks as much like our beautiful city as possible. And we will keep at it. Uh, slow and steady wins the race. Uh, moving on, Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative. I'm also pleased to share that I've been accepted to this leadership initiative sponsored by Bloomberg Philanthropies and Harvard University. This is a year-long leadership and management training for up to 40 mayors from around the globe and two senior officials from each city crucial to affecting organizational change. There are both in-person and virtual classes taught by Harvard Business School and Harvard Kennedy School faculty, along with communication support research networking, and we also get a fellow from Harvard Graduate School. 
This is a relatively new program. It's uh, third year. It will kick off on Sunday, July 14th with three-day in-person intensive in New York City. Later in August, Jess King, our Chief of Staff, and Milzy Carrasco, Director of Neighbor Engagement, are heading to New York as well. Beyond committing to a full participation, Lancaster will also commit to improving one key practice over the course of the year, and we get to pick. Uh, so we have not yet determined this. Key practices must focus on cross-boundary collaboration, data, and evidence, or innovation. So more to come on that, but I just wanted to let Council know that um, it's my pleasure to be representing our city uh, with 39 other mayors from across the world. And a few other quick updates. Uh, the second annual Neighbor to Neighbor Forum was held on Saturday. It was a great day with 85 people in attendance, lots of great outcomes, and more neighborhood organizing efforts are blooming across the city, which is super exciting. And I appreciate council members who were able to attend. Also, uh, our staff picnic was on Friday. It was our largest turnout ever. Um, Councilor President Reichenbach um, was there. We've been so fortunate to have significantly more employee engagement in recent events, including the United Way trike race, where we had four teams, Open Streets, Red Rose Run, and more. I'm really grateful for how our employees continue to show up in support of our city and city government. And finally, paving is in full swing. <laughs> I'm really <laughs> smiling about this, but... There's, there's a, a well, uh, Rockland uh, from Green to Dauphin is paved, Dauphin from Lyme to Duke, Conestoga from Union to Prince, Beaver from Conestoga to Furnace, and Hershey from Manor to Fairview is in the final stages of completion. And the counterpoint to this is that already I've received a complaint from a resident on Beaver Street because now the street is paved and people are speeding. So <laughs> it happens just like clockwork. Uh, complaints about the conditions of streets are quickly transitioned to complaints about speeding. So please, please, please slow down and remember that there will be a lot more children on our streets given that today was the last day of school. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have no report this evening, so council comments? Hearing none, I'll hear a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank you all for hanging with us.